Hello, and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen. I'm the program manager for the Recycling Market Center and will serve as your moderator today. Today's webinar topic is the closed loop recovery of gypsum wallboard. Our presenter today is Amanda Kaminsky, who I will introduce in a moment. Following her presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the Q&A feature located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you're experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that an edited version of the webinar will be made available for viewing via YouTube links on the National Recycling Coalition and PA Recycling Market Center websites. And now I'm gonna introduce Amanda. Uh, Amanda is founder and principal of Building Product Ecosystems, LLC, operating multidisciplinary collaboratives that involves feedstocks, recycling, infrastructure, and logistics for optimal systemic health and performance of major building materials on behalf of building owners, their supply chains, recycling networks, and impacted communities. Amanda carefully pilots improvements on projects under active development with building owners, manufacturers, recyclers, contractors, designers, and engineers, regional policymakers, and academic researchers. Collective pilot learnings are shared amongst collaborators for expedited industry progress. Informed by piloting and lab testing, solutions are quality controlled and streamlined for scaled implementation via evolution of existing codes and standards and creation of new ones. BPE was originally founded by Amanda and the Durst organization as a public private partnership with the New School City University of New York, Healthy Building Network and Vaderis. Before and during early stages of BPE, Amanda also led sustainable construction and procurement efforts at the Durst organization from 2005 to 2015 on large scale real estate development projects. In collaboration with New York City Department of Sanitation, she managed execution of New York City's first high rise residential organics collection and compost program and further deployed those learnings and rollout of the first portfolio wide commercial organics collection program in the city. Amanda chairs the Health Product De Declaration Collaborative Board and is a director on the Board of Healthy Building Network. She holds a BS degree in architecture from University of Virginia. And I'll turn the program over to Amanda. Thank you, Wayne. Hi, everybody. Um, I am happy to be here with you guys today and uh, look forward to a, a good dialogue. So, uh, you know, I'm going to run through um, some of the background on the piloting that we're doing in a few locations uh, for closed loop gypsum wallboard recycling. Um, but I also am really looking forward to uh, dialogue. So um, encourage questions and comments and suggestions as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So as Wayne mentioned, um, Building Product Ecosystems uh, was originated as a public-private partnership, and the impetus for it um, was really because in uh, procurement of a lot of our major building materials, when I was working for a large real estate developer in New York City, uh, we were finding that some of the some of the full uh, system cycles of the major building materials that we were buying for, for these large projects uh, were far from perfect. And when we looked to try to make improvements uh, in collaboration with the manufacturers, we realized that it was a lot more complex than just um, that binary relationship, that there were a lot of other folks that needed to be involved and frankly also a lot of other building owners, even though um, the scale of our purchasing was quite large. Uh, we, we still weren't large enough to just uh, kind of make that ask and have um, everybody follow suit just because we were asking for it. So, um, so we uh, got together with a number of other building owners and um, uh, the manufacturers that we were speaking with in particular in the gypsum uh, manufacturing community and then also uh, with uh, concrete producers because that's another area of focus which I won't be talking so much about today but a lot of the themes are consistent. Um, and uh, in addition, a lot of our uh, recyclers and uh, government agency partners, um, some of the research community, and then of course uh, our construction 
management teams and our uh, the, you know, the engineers and architects that we were working with on a regular basis. And uh, we started to make um, some pretty good progress uh, just in the first few months of this public-private partnership. And um, it be, we realized it became something that uh, needed to be needed to kind of stand on its own two feet as an independent organization. And so that's what building product ecosystems is today. So I just uh, went through my master composter training last year and I am um, a, big, a big believer in composting as a, a great model for um, really so many other resource management systems because it's uh, pretty readily accessible to a lot of people. So I think it's uh, less abstract than some of the material flows that people don't have as much um, access to. So uh, I, I reference composting a lot in, um, in the work that we do because I think it's a, a good model. So in looking at gypsum or really any of the materials that we're working with, um, we're really looking at all of the different phases of uh, how a material is derived and used and uh, reused and uh, really uh, trying to very honestly and transparently look at the impacts at each of those phases. I apologize for the background construction noise here. Uh, it's not really never, background is never quiet here in New York City. Um, so, you know, we're really trying to minimize any externalized impacts, um, and because that's, uh, I think that it's it's pretty hard to always get that kind of information, but it's becoming easier uh, with the proliferation of data, and so that's uh, that's one of the, the the focuses of our work. So why closed loop drywall? Uh, these are some, uh, this is some background information from the EPA. So 548 million tons of CND debris are generated annually in the US. Um, this, is, this is data from 2015. Also, just to put this into context, and a lot of, um, you know, uh, there's a, been a lot of construction over the last uh, few years. Uh, everybody's very busy. I imagine these numbers are only increasing, but this is the most recent year for which we have uh, uh, comprehensive data. So that 548 million tons of CND debris is twice the amount of generated MSW. So just to kind of put that into context, I don't know how many um, folks in the industry that we have that focus on MSW and how, ma how many that, um, actually Wayne, is that something that you know or anybody could speak to? Um, just so I have some context of the folks on the call, um, you know, where, whether the focus of a lot of the folks on the call is uh, in construction and demolition or municipal recycling? I would think it'd be a, a combination of both. Okay. So. Okay. And, you know, as we've looked at um, gypsum recycling, um, it's been helpful to understand, uh, you know, how that breaks out between demolition and, and new construction. Uh, demolition can be more challenging in some ways, especially when we're focused on gypsum, but it's, um, you know, based on the statistics, it's important to ensure that we're really thinking about um, how we manage the, the demolition or renovation material stream alongside the, um, the new construction stream, which can be maybe a little bit more straightforward to manage. Um, and the fact that a lot of this material is originating from non-residential sources as well. Um, so a lot of this information has guided the trajectory of uh, focus for the work that we're doing uh, with closed loop gypsum wall board recycling. So 13 million tons, it's estimated, uh, is, uh, is generated on an annual basis in the US uh, gypsum wallboard debris. I think this is a conservative estimate because the, um, this is the debris that is uh, generated that's identifiable as gypsum wallboard. And of course we have a lot of fines uh, that originate uh, from gypsum wallboard um, that you know, um, those fines get commingled uh, with a number of other um, materials in particular wood. Um, so I, th I think this number is actually um, somewhat higher than this estimate, but this is being conservative. And from that uh, 13 million tons, um, we understand that only currently about 2% of that is being recycled back into new gypsum wallboard manufacturing. Approximately 8% 
is uh, recycled into soil amendment for agricultural uses, and about 90% is landfilled. As I mentioned before, so um, also information from the EPA, about 75% of the gypsum debris generated is uh, coming from demolition projects, 25% from new construction trim scrap. And uh, for, for uh, folks that might not be as familiar with uh, gypsum wallboard manufacturing, about 50% of the wallboard that's manufactured, um, the feedstock comes from natural mine gypsum sources. Um, so it's mined from the ground. And about 50% comes from uh, flue gas desulfurization uh, or synthetic gypsum, which is a byproduct from coal-fired power generation. And that this data comes from USGS, which publishes really fantastic annual uh, mineral commodity summaries. And so um, this is from uh, 2019 data on 2018. So you can see in this graph um, from the UN uh, Environment Program that um, you know our mining of uh, materials has increased a, a good amount um, over the last few decades, and uh, gypsum is included in that top tranche of um, of data in that dark gray. Um, and so there in particular, there's been a threefold increase in, um, in mining over the last few decades. Um, so when we talk about uh, stores available of gypsum, um, you know, the I understand from manufacturers that their best estimate is that there's, you know, approximately um, 90 to 100 year supply still of gypsum, which, um, I don't think is a very long time, but uh, is also, I think, I think we also need to be considering the impacts around these mine sites, the environmental impacts, um, alongside the fact that um, we're uh, really kind of throwing away valuable resources when we're not recycling this material. Also, as many of you are probably aware, um, in landfills, um, in, in particular in locations where we have uh, humid climates and um, when, we get, when we encounter anaerobic uh, conditions, which are pretty common in landfills when materials are layered on top of other materials, um, we get hydrogen sulfide generation and gypsum is a major contributor of hydrogen sulfide gas. And a lot of people, uh, associate hydrogen sulfide gas with that rotten egg smell that you smell around landfills. So it's, you know, it's very unpleasant. Um, but in addition to being unpleasant, it's also, uh, it also has uh, some pretty substantive health impacts for the communities that live around these landfills, um, ranging from uh, being an asthmogen at uh, lower levels to having more, uh, even more severe impacts um, to cognitive function at higher levels. So this is actually causing, uh, you know, I've been seeing increasingly in the news, and I guess it's because, uh, maybe because there is so much construction happening, uh, maybe also because we've been having um, some, we have a pretty wet winter, uh, but a lot of this is coming to a head in many regions with uh, communities um, speaking up about concerns uh, around hydrogen sulfide gas and, um, some landfills being put on notice as a result uh, to remediate this situation. Interestingly, you know, a lot of um, a lot of these landfills are remediating by venting or, or doing other things to um, to cover. Um, but I don't hear a lot of discussion about um, uh, bans on the types of materials that are causing hydrogen sulfide gas generation. And to me, it seems like. Um, some of these other solutions are band-aids uh, rather than getting at the source of uh, what's causing the, the uh, H2S generation to begin with. Um, so I think we have a lot of room for progress in how, um, how these problems are remediated closer to the source. So 
further, you know, exacerbating some of these challenges, uh, landfill capacities uh, are projected to, uh, to drop a good amount over the next five years, um, hearing that a lot of landfills are reaching their daily uh, maximums uh, earlier in the day. This, of course, is also a, a problem for um, the drivers um, who then need to drive even farther distances to get to uh, places to tip loads. And um, you know that has a lot of impact on infrastructure, roads infrastructure, um, also on the economy of um, of all of this uh, hauling and the um, the impacts to the recycling uh, facilities and governments as well. So um, and, you know, there's also the carbon impact to all of that transport. So this graphic is from um, EREF. Um, this is really looking at uh, an assessment of tipping fees from 2016 through 2018, and as you can see in uh, in particular in a, a few regions um, in the Pacific states and also in the Northeast, uh, there's a, a steady increase in uh, tipping fees and, you know, sort of always going to be a supply and demand uh, calculation and, you know, there's less and less um, availability of space and therefore these fees are creeping up uh, consistently. So this, as a result, um, this is a forecast to 2021 of uh, these fees in these different regions by the Waste Business Journal, and this was published last year. So you can see, again, in, um, in the specific regions mentioned, almost an 11% increase in the Pacific states. And then in the Northeast, 6% um, increase over these five years in question. Again, these are projections, of course. So, you know, when we're considering um, feedstocks also for some of these major building materials and, you know, understanding that um, a pretty substantive amount of the feedstock for gypsum manufacturing actually 50% comes from uh, coal-fired power generation. And seeing these trends in, and understanding these trends in coal-fired power over time, and then therefore the byproduct of uh, those processes, um, it starts to beg the question, you know, what's gonna be happening? This is, this is um, from an article that was published in the New York Times in December, which um, it shows a specific uh, graphic like this for every state. Um, so it's a pretty cool article and pretty cool tool. Um, interesting to see. The Pennsylvania I'm showing here um, because you know we've been working, we've been doing a lot of work in New York City, and um, a lot of the wallboard that is uh, supplied into New York City is manufactured in Pennsylvania. And we also know that a lot of that gypsum uh, wallboard is uh, is derived from coal-fired power byproduct. So when we start to see these changes in, um, in power generation, it's, it's, you know, for us, not just about the, the power itself, but also um, the byproducts that are used to make, um, make our building materials. And so this is um, an article that was published in fall of last year, specific to a, manufact a wallboard manufacturing facility outside of Pittsburgh. And the power plant uh, that uh, generates the synthetic gypsum that's used by that manufacturing facility is slated to close in the next couple of years. And so they, um, their wallboard is made of 95% synthetic gypsum, 95 to 98% synthetic gypsum. And so it, it you know, they're, they're uh, located right across the street from this uh, power plant. So the economics for both the power plant and that gypsum manufacturing facility um, work out quite well um, for um, for you know both uh, both entities, and it's really going to shift the economics for the manufacturing of that material uh, when that power plant goes offline. So they're either going to need to be getting the their byproduct. Well, they'll definitely need to be getting um, their feedstock from natural mined gypsum sources. Um, and then uh, potentially also from post-consumer sources now. Um, 
this graph is from the American Coal Ash Association, and um, this is talking about their 2017 numbers um, in uh, basically the, the byproduct generated by coal-fired power plants across the U.S., um, what, the, what that byproduct is going into, and I have highlighted in orange uh, the gypsum specific um, materials and cement um, specific uh, materials that it goes into and agriculture as well. So you can see at the top of that column, it's FGD gypsum, which is flue gas desulfurization gypsum, which is this byproduct from coal that we've been talking about. Um, and so the majority of that byproduct does go into making gypsum wallboard. Um, there is a portion of it that goes um, into agricultural soil amendment. Um, and then also some that does go into cement production. So, um, and these are based, you know, in large part on what the demand is in each of those different end markets. We've been focused um, also in post-consumer recycling on, uh, you know, this material going back into gypsum uh, wallboard manufacturing. Uh, we believe it's, you know, kind of the highest and best use of the material gypsum is um, endlessly recyclable. So, you know, this graph is, or this uh, chart is talking about the synthetic gypsum, but, uh, you know, a lot of the same trends hold true in um, what we will hope to see over time in uh, the post-consumer uh, marketplace as well. So this is, this chart is post-industrial, but um, we're really focused on, uh, you know, how, we're, how we kind of move some of this mindset into post-consumer usage. So at the top here, this, is, um, this quote is actually from a National Geographic article that was published earlier this year um, on the impacts of coal ash. Um, and it referenced that about 23 billion in revenue each year is generated for coal utilities um, through the use of coal byproduct. And I bring that up because um, some of you might be familiar with the Kingston, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, ash slide that happened in 2008. Um, and then of course, uh, with some of the impacts from these storage ponds uh, from just this last fall uh, during Hurricane Florence. And uh, a lot of the building owners that, um, uh, that I'm hearing from are have a lot of concerns about the content of the ash um, and its usage. You know, I, th I think there's a um, a big push to get uh, some of this ash out of storage ponds because of some of the the potential impacts that um, you know you can see here in this photograph from that spill. Um, also, to you know, some of the workers around uh, some of those facilities. Um, and so a lot of people want to get the material out of the ash ponds and into um, beneficial use, as it's called. Uh, but a lot of building owners have concerns about putting this material because of some of its chemical constituents um, into building products, um, both because of concerns about um, you know, the legacy uh, for the buildings and the, for the occupants of the buildings and the, the people that are installing the products. Um, and then also just concerns about, uh, you know, what happens over time with, um, you know, the content of this material in, in buildings. Uh, we also are working with considerations around concrete. And, you know, if you go to uh, polish a concrete floor um, with fly ash, is there concern about the heavy metal content? Um, a lot of these are some unanswered questions, but a lot of building owners are um, just concerned about the, the potential there for migration of some of those components that are undesirable. They see them as a liability. So in looking at, um, you know, looking at recycled content that is, um, you know, really a comprehensive, uh, desirable sort of uh, recycled content. A lot of municipalities are um, considering what their role needs to be in managing uh, both procurement of materials um, and also um, managing how uh, demolition and 
uh, construction happens in the best way possible to set up the whole system to be optimized uh, for different building materials. And so here on the screen, you see um, from the city of Seattle, there is uh, an ordinance in place that is being um, upheld right now for construction and demolition projects uh, that requires that, um, that they not landfill uh, gypsum wallboard. And so um, there's, uh, this is the case in other locations um, how wet, but you know, including British Columbia, for instance. Um, it's also the case in Massachusetts, um, although there's been some challenge uh, upholding uh, the, the regulation in Massachusetts due to a lack of uh, folks to do the processing in that region. So we hope that that uh, evolves over time and that the end markets uh, come into place for gypsum wallboard to be able to be um, truly banned from uh, uh, landfill landfills uh, from debris coming out of that region as well. So we understand too that you know for folks that are uh, specifying materials, uh, purchasing materials on construction projects, that the rubric of um, how uh, procurement is structured is quite complex. There's a lot of different factors um, to consider in purchasing building materials. Um, there's a lot at stake. Um, and so, you know, we're adding in a lot of other considerations here um, when we're looking at the health of uh, material feedstocks, how these uh, scraps, uh, both from the new construction trim scrap and from uh, demolition or renovation over time are going to be managed or are capable of being managed. Um, so it, uh, you know, it's not easy to, um, to add this other layer in, but it's uh, also very important. The stakes are kind of high, uh, as we just discussed. So this is from another project um, here in New York where uh, the um, design team has uh, put in place some requirements for extended producer responsibility on the procurement and um, recycled content requirements are not uncommon, of course, uh, but teams are looking a lot more at the nature of that recycled content and, uh, you know, uh, questioning a little bit more the health of that recycled content on a, on a full systems basis. We're also seeing over time, uh, and it's not referenced here in particular, but um, an increase in some cases of requirement for post-consumer content in lieu of uh, post-industrial content where that makes sense. And so this is a construction waste management specification where um, there's a requirement to uh, uh, work with the manufacturer directly on reclamation and um, manage a, uh, this is from a, an existing building project. And so to manage the, um, you know, logistics considerations for um, gypsum recycling, you know, considering loading dock uh, reservations and things like that, um, that are necessary to make this work. So these are some of the tools uh, that some of the project teams uh, that we're working with are using. Um, uh, for full disclosure, I am a, um, I chair the board for the Health Product Declaration Collaborative um, and see the type of information that uh, HPDs supply as being really critical, um, both from a procurement, from the procurement end of things, but also in really thinking about how we manage these materials through to end of current life into next life um, generation of products. So really looking at um, a real transparent disclosure of content, first of all, but then also looking at the health of that content. Um, EPDs also, this is an, an EPD from CertainTeed. And this is from their Seattle facility and their Vancouver facility. Um, you can see down at the bottom of the CPD uh, the amount of post-consumer content. Um, this is this is relatively high um, in a good way for um, 
for post-consumer content and gypsum board manufacturing in the US. In Europe, you'll see higher levels, uh, but uh, this is pretty progressive uh, here in the US. And uh, in part, this is able to happen because um, in British Columbia, there's been a landfill ban for a number of decades or around the Vancouver area because of concerns around um, hydrogen sulfide gas uh, there. And so it's a, a more mature market for uh, management of uh, gypsum drywall away from landfilling. And so um, the end use market has, has been uh, relatively developed for a number of decades now. Um, so I would say certainty though, under the, um, the, their um, parent company, Saint-Gobain, um, which is an international company, um, has, has, is pretty experienced with, uh, you know, really um, managing the uh, manufacturing components of, you know, how to really incorporate this higher level of post-consumer content. They said that they've gotten up to um, 30 and 35 percent in some locations um, in their R&D of uh, figuring out how to uptake uh, more, more and more post-consumer content into gypsum while we're manufacturing. Uh, so it's, they, and they hope to be able to get up to 40%. So uh, this is just really helpful, I think, in understanding uh, what's possible uh, in the grand scheme of uh, where we can go with incorporation of, uh, of post-consumer content across the board um, with, with gypsum manufacturing. Um, so, Lead V 4.1 uh, beta language you see on the left here, and this is starting to, it, I, I think this, um, this de there's definitely more work to be done on this, but you start to see references um, now to Recycling Certification Institute and uptake of, um, uh, or sorry, um, inclu uh, including recycling facilities that have verified data, third party verified data. Um, and you know this became more important to me um, whenever I, I started to see that you know sometimes rates including alternative daily cover or not including and not including alternative daily cover sometimes weren't very different or different at all from some facilities and it, you know while some facilities may not send um, material into um, uh, alternative daily cover usage at landfills. Um, I know that a lot of them do, and so it um, it made me realize that it was really important to um, uh, you know really verify that the the first of all that everybody's tracking uh, data in a harmonized way, uh, in, you know in in different locations and throughout different facilities. Um, but I I just wanted to um, also verify that for projects that we were working on that um, we could really trust the information that was. Um, coming from facilities was um, was tracked uh, consistently. And that data is so important because it enables us to focus on where we prioritize improvements um, in our procurement and in our collaboration with those recycling facilities to, um, to really improve what we're giving them to. Um, uh, you know, it's really a collaboration from the construction site through the recycling process. If you give a recycling facility, a bunch of contaminated crap. They're not magicians who can, you know, somehow turn that into usable resources. Well, some of them are, but um, um, we see this as a pretty intensive collaboration from, um, from the building owner's um, role all the way through uh, the role of the recyclers that we're collaborating with. And so this data and, and trusting this data is really key to, um, to the constant uh, optimization that we're all working on together. So these are uh, um, some letters that were written a couple of years ago now by a couple of uh, major purchasers of gypsum wallboard who are really vested in making closed loop wallboard recycling um, happen at, um, at a greater scale. And so, this was written to the uh, gypsum wallboard manufacturers to help them understand their desire to purchase material with higher post-consumer content, but also to help them understand that they're in this with them, um, that the, you know, they want to understand from the manufacturers 
uh, what else they can be doing from their construction sites to make this easier, what else they can be doing in procurement requirements to increase the amount of post-consumer content in the wallboard that they purchase, understanding that it's, again, um, necessarily a, a pretty intensive collaboration that's required in order to um, in order to expand this. It's not just a, a simply an ask of the manufacturers and all on the manufacturer's shoulders, nor is it something that's all on the recycler's shoulders. So this is from a, um, a manufacturing facility visit, uh, Pabco Gypsum in uh, the Bay Area in Newark, California. Um, so this is a Google team and their construction management folks along with the Pabco manufacturing uh, folks really discussing some of the logistics for how we were going to manage um, the their take back of uh, scrap from a large uh, Google project in the region. These are zero waste design guidelines that were um, uh, created for New York City, but have, um, uh, I think, real benefit and value for a lot of um, regions around the US and beyond. Um, these were developed uh, in large part by Claire Mifflin in collaboration with a lot of other folks um, in New York City and beyond. Uh, they're quite useful, I think. Um, uh, they cover a lot of different ground for uh some considerations in construction in design of course um and then also into operations um so i think they're worth a look i thought this was interesting this was a new york city curb to market challenge uh posed to uh really in encourage new markets for locally generated materials I haven't seen uh, the application or the submissions for this yet. I think they're due sometime this summer. So it'll be interesting to see what gets submitted. So what we're working with here then as a result of all of this market demand and the, um, the various drivers that have been mentioned is, you know, taking a, what has been a very linear system and um, uh, really putting a loop into it um, that doesn't, fully you know, remove that uh, landfill component, but greatly diminishes it. Um, and so um, what we're working with here in this region in New York, um, you can see here, this is taken from our website. Um, this map shows um, the various parties and entities needed for the, the ecosystem to really be robust. So, um, I don't know if you guys, can you see my cursor? Yeah, we can see that. Okay. So, you know, here concentrated in New York City, um, you know, we have some, uh, some building projects in blue. Um, we obviously have so, a number of recyclers, um, but I think it's important to show then how that uh, contextually links to um, where the, the wallboard out of New York City is, um, is going. And so, um, right now, a lot of the, um, most of the gypsum, if not all of the gypsum that, that um, gets diverted from landfill uh, gets processed here in Denver, Pennsylvania by USA Gypsum and Terry Weaver there. Um, and then uh, the, the component of that material that's going into closed loop wallboard recycling for the most part is ending up at USG at their Washingtonville plant here. Um, we have a layer that shows coal-fired power plants um, uh, also on this map, just for context to kind of keep an eye on um, where some of those plants are uh, going, going to be going offline and where there's going to need to be um, alternative sources of gypsum. So that's what that layer of uh, information is for. Um, I know that some of the material out of Massachusetts right now is also coming down to Terry Weaver, but that's a pretty good distance to travel. Um, our hope is that uh, in the not too distant future, um, the, these wallboard manufacturers up here in New Hampshire, um, it's National Gypsum and Georgia Pacific um, will begin accepting uh, gypsum scrap out of Massachusetts, enabling uh, Massachusetts to better uphold its landfill ban on drywall. So this shows um, the uh, Bay Area 
ecosystem that we've been working with. Um, so these are the some of the Google projects. We also have a couple of other projects under discussion right now um, that are up in San Francisco um, with Lendlease. Uh, the wallboard manufacturers that are taking material back from the Google projects right now are Pabco here in Newark um, and then National Gypsum up in Richmond, so pretty close by. Um, some AgGyp is also being processed by these facilities um, not too far away as well. So in order to really increase the, um, you know, the uptake of closed loop work, uh, we're piloting on um, some, some active projects. Um, this building on the left here that you see is uh, the VIA 57 West building that was um, the first project in New York alongside a Columbia University Manhattanville project, um, that a laboratory project that, um, that both were the, the first pilots here in New York City um, that recycled uh, all of their new construction gypsum trim scrap. Um, this project right here on the right is another project over in Queens, which is a mixed use building um, with, um, with affordable housing as well. Um, and uh, this project is the most recent. Um, so this has become standard practice for, um, for the Durst organization here in New York City. So all of their projects, closed loop recycle, new construction trim scrap, um, and they're working on also making this happen for a renovation material out of their existing buildings as well. So this is not New York City, this is in the Bay Area, this is from a Google project. Um, there's more space for source separation, um, obviously, uh, in, um, uh, you know, outside of dense urban settings, um, but we've figured out the logistics to make it work in um, urban settings as well. Um, hopefully this works. I'm going to show a brief video here on um, some of the logistics or how we're making this work. Um, in, uh, this is from the VIA project and um, here in New York City, the residential building, and then also from the Columbia Manhattanville Laboratory building um, and from another residential building in New York. Can you turn up the volume a little bit, Amanda? It's all the way up. Is it? Can you hear it? Barely. Um, it's always going to take. Is that any better? Better? Yep. Okay, well, originally, like uh, if we're sheetrocking a floor, you have a mixture of, of debris. Yeah, you'll have electrical debris, uh, some metal studs, uh, drywall products, uh, plumbing debris. So we would come on with a labor crew and basically uh, sweep through and, and pick up all the garbage, stick it in uh, mini containers uh, or baskets, bring it down to either a central container or, or dump it in a packer. Uh, what we're doing now is basically the same thing, except there's two separate sweeps, okay? Now, with the two separate sweeps, you may say that, oh, I'm double handling garbage, but it's really not the case because uh, when we come in first with the, uh, with the drywall cleanup crew, all right, they come through, they pick up all the drywall, and that's less for the second crew to do. So the labor of time for cleanup actually worked out being the same. For the, the wallboard recycling, we've essentially added one extra man to go through and collect all the sheetrock on the floors ahead of the guys that would be doing the general house cleaning. Um, maybe two guys to then fill a 30 yarder, but it's all material that would have been taken down from the building anyway. I was actually surprised. Once we got started here, there was little to no impact on, on the things that, that I care about, which are you know time, schedule, budget. Uh, we were able to, to get a recycling program with uh, sheetrock and have very little impact on the job. We do two floors of sheetrock a week, and we fill a 30-hour container every two days. So we're talking about changing everybody's practices from um, the project manager to the drywall hanger uh, to the laborers who are cleaning up. And uh, also even the waste companies of, okay, it, it can't be co-mingled, it's gotta come out separated. So I think changing the mindset of the construction industry to source separation is, is the biggest challenge. 
we all got used to recycling at home. Now we're used to recycling at work. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So um, just to give you a little bit of uh, understanding of how that's happening um, on these New York City construction projects. So, um, so sometimes when a, a project doesn't have the space at ground level to store an extra 30 yarder, um, what, what happened in the Columbia Laboratory, uh, Columbia University Laboratory building was they uh, staged the minis on the floor where the scrap was generated until they had sufficient number to fill a 30 yarder. They bring the 30 yarder in and then dump all the minis um, in that 30 yarder right away and then get it right back out. So it was only, uh, you know, an uh, hour and a half or so uh, tops, actually not even that, more like an hour of being um, in the, um, the loading area. So this, this shows some of the different mechanisms for um, collecting the material on a floor by floor basis um, with um, uh, you know some of these being more appropriate for um, existing building renovation projects um, some of these being um, more appropriate for new construction um, but really anything goes it's kind of what uh, what works best for the project at hand um, I know a lot of times on um, some projects here in New York City, they're using hampers for the uh, the gypsum wallboard because at that phase of the project, they're uh, wanting not to uh, nick any finished corners anyway, and so that works out well as a as the distinction. Um, these Tommy carts are a really good system um, with burns uh, out of Philadelphia. And then at the loading dock level, um, as you saw in the video, having either you know two uh, source separated or a source separated gypsum uh, 30 yarder and then a commingled 30 yarder, and uh, frequently what we try to do is have the uh, the source separated uh, been farther from where more of the foot traffic around the loading dock is happening. So in case somebody you know, tosses an empty coffee cup or a pizza crust, uh, it goes into the commingled bin and not into the, the gypsum bin, which we try to minimize contamination of. Um, whenever we have wet weather consistently, uh, we tarp over the bin, although it doesn't, uh, it hasn't been a problem to have some moisture um, because the, the bins get emptied so frequently anyway, so it's not like they're sitting in uh, standing water. This bin has the capability to, um, have its interior partitions moved uh, so that you could put a few different material types or separated material types into the bin and um, and have some flexibility there. And then this is from an existing building project um, where they're loading these. This is sort of a temporary fix for loading uh, material into a box truck out of an existing building project. And so this is the processing component here. Um, this is at Terry Weaver's facility. And then um, this picture in the center middle is from uh, New West Gypsum's facility in Seattle. Um, but you can see then at the bottom, the uh, source separated, or sorry, the processed gypsum in the bottom center uh, separated from or screened from the paper facing scrap. And that paper facing usually goes uh, to animal bedding, although we're told that it um, it can also be used for making ceiling tile, uh, but if that's uh, I don't think that's happening at at large scale yet. So speaking of scale, um, these are the last few slides here. Uh, we after uh, a few years of piloting are have been working on um, standardizing some of what's been learned um, with necessary quality controls. So working on a, an ASTM standard um, with the gypsum manufacturers and the gypsum association and the recyclers. Um, this standard has been mostly focused on new construction trim scrap so far. Um, it doesn't preclude usage uh, uh, you know, for renovation material. Um, this graph on the left was developed as um, just a, it's not part of the standard, but it uh, was kind of a useful, tool in trying to figure out where, oops, sorry, where, where does the path kind of bisect in um, how to handle different materials from different points in time to ensure that um, 
we don't have um, trouble with asbestos or lead contamination um, based on understanding, you know, when those materials uh, stopped being in prevalent usage. And this, uh, the standard on the left is uh, PAS 109. Uh, this is uh, available online. It's a European standard. Uh, it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, that helps to guide the, uh, the process for closed loop recycling gypsum. And then on the right here is the Construction Demolition Recycling Association's uh, resource that was uh, or specification that was developed by CDRA in collaboration with uh, folks from the University of Florida. And this is sort of a, um, an Americanized version of this PAS 109. So kind of taking into context some of our uh, ways of doing things, both from a governmental standpoint and um, just some of the, the realistic logistics uh, on construction sites and recycling facilities here. So this is um, very focused on uh, the recycling process itself, but also with nods to what needs to be happening on construction sites. So as you can see, um, you know, we've been working a lot with, uh, with a, a, a number of different projects, uh, mostly on the, on the coasts be, uh, of the U.S. because that's where there's been most demand as a result of um, a lot of construction happening, but also um, a lot of pain points with um, with landfill uh, diminishing landfill space and landfill tipping fees. Um, but this is uh, you know this is something that we're really looking at making happen in in many locations across the U.S. increasingly, in collaboration with all these different people that need to be involved to make it happen. So that's it. Any questions? Okay, uh, great presentation, Amanda. Really good, good uh, content and, and graphics. So we do have a couple of questions here uh, before we have to leave. Uh, I know Amanda has a, a call at two, so we're going to get a couple of questions here. Okay. Um, so uh, can the gypsum wallbird, if it gets wet, can it still be reused or recycled? Yes. So. You know, usually um, the uh, the pace of these projects um, indicates that the you know the gypsum scrap is not going to be sitting in these containers for very long. So um, the material, what is typically happening on these projects, is um, the material is getting carted away probably twice a week um, and then tipped at a um, a central facility, a recycling facility. And then once there's enough material to do a larger shipment to a processor or to a manufacturer, um, the material then makes its way there. But there's, it, generally speaking, the material doesn't stay in one place for a very long period of time. It's consistently being moved around and airing out. Um, so as long as it's not immersed in water for a very long period of time and then um, kind of... Uh, in an enclosed situation where mold um, can, um, you know, can generate, um, you know, wallboard manufacturers are generally speaking going to want, uh, you know, they want the least contamination possible in, in this material that they're getting back and as dry as possible. And generally speaking, it's, um, it is easier to cart lighter material. And so the drier you can keep it, the better because it uh, reduces the weight of the loads that are being hauled. So, uh, but generally speaking, it hasn't, we haven't seen it be, we haven't seen moisture be an issue yet. Uh, it appears that uh, you're only targeting new wall board scrap. Are there any plans for the demolition side of wall board scrap? Yeah, definitely. So the, the the major challenge with that is um, wallboard manufacturers, uh, you know, being comfortable accepting um, what can be the higher variability or more variability in that content. And so that's where the quality controls come in to ensure that um, no matter where the source or what the source of the gypsum is for the manufacturer, whether it's natural mine gypsum or uh, synthetic gypsum from coal-fired power plants or post-consumer gypsum from harvested from construction sites that they can depend on uh, the quality being consistent and the content being consistent. And so 
um, that's uh, that's what's that's definitely a focus right now. And so we st we are starting to have a couple of pilot projects that are uh, incorporating post use material, renovation material. And so we're working through that as we go. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the, the health and environmental concerns of, of the gypsum. Um, I just, I'm just curious, are there any studies out there that have done any you know, indoor air quality studies? Uh, how about even at the manufacturing plants? Is there a, a health and safety issue there uh, yeah. in the manufacturing process? So we did some um, some basic um, study with City University of New York uh, with Brooklyn College here um, in New York, and they found that there was a slightly higher level of mercury content in board that um, came from coal-fired power plant um, byproduct, but it um, it wasn't high high enough to um, to pose an issue for indoor air quality. Um, was their assessment? Um, what was found was that the, um, the effluent um, and the emissions from, coal, from wallboard manufacturing facilities that utilize FGD gypsum or synthetic gypsum from coal-fired power plants, um, that the, uh, the mercury content in the effluent and, the, and their emissions was higher. So it's more of an impact to the the surrounding community um, than the manufacturer, than the, the workers necessarily in the plant. And I've been told somewhere, I don't know, I'm not sure where I found or got this information that the, the chemical makeup of, of the natural gypsum versus the synthetic is, is virtually the same. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Generally speaking, it's very, it's very similar. Okay. And then time for one more question. Are there any outlets for demo gypsum scrap in the Midwest? Uh, is there a specific uh, location? I feel like the Midwest is pretty broad, but um, I don't know if there's a more specific location. What we're, we're working with Chicago right now. Indiana, and, Indiana. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so um, we've actually just recently been hearing a lot from folks in Indianapolis and in Chicago. Um, in trying to figure out um, some end, uh, some market end use for gypsum scrap, and um, one thing that we're noticing is that um, I think that it's in uh, wheat field. If I hope I'm getting that right, that there's a a power plant that's actually um, uh, in 2023. I think through four of the units are going offline there, um, the coal-fired power units are going offline there. And there is a Georgia Pacific facility right there that, um, that must use a lot of that uh, material for feedstock. And so uh, we have just started reaching out to Georgia Pacific to understand you know, if they're gonna be seeking, sorry for the siren in the background, <laughs> um, so see if they're going to be seeking different sources of recycled content and potentially post-consumer content. Um, so uh, USG, uh, the gypsum wallboard manufacturing facility, also has facilities just outside of Chicago. And so um, that's uh, an increasing area of focus for us. So um, stay tuned. Okay. So the siren means we're out of time. So we're going to wrap <laughs> it up here. So again, this webinar, like all the webinars in this series, has been recorded and will be made available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center websites. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you'll join us for next month's webinar. Please visit the NRC and RMC websites for schedule updates. And thank you again, Amanda, for, for the great presentation. Sure. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Okay, you too.